We'll start off with a few um, opening remarks from Frank Brown, and then we'll move right into our panel. Thank you, Michelle. And welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Frank Brown, and I'm the director of the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE, as we call it. I'd like to welcome you to this working session on the democracy dividends of ESG investing. To make sure we're all on the same page, I'd like to take a couple minutes to define the terms of today's somewhat specialized discussion. First, what is ESG investing? The letters refer to the environmental, social, and governance dimensions of business activity. Think about the benefits that flow to a company that has a governance structure in place that reduces corruption and fraud. Or think about the social dimension of a company's operations and how a stable, healthy workforce boosts productivity. And finally, when it comes to the E, the environmental factors of business operations, any prudent company must take into account the financial risks of polluting and the potential benefits of transitioning from fossil fuels. So that's ESG investing. How these factors are measured and valued varies widely. There is no uniform, globally accepted standard. But all the same, ESG factors are vitally important to investors who are putting their money in ESG-branded companies at a record pace these days. Businesses, of course, can choose to ignore or embrace ESG standards. More and more, businesses are claiming some kind of adherence to ESG priorities. Currently, ESG and so-called socially responsible investments make up about $2 trillion of assets under management globally. So why are we here talking about ESG investing at a rule of law conference? We're here because embedded in the ESG standards, often inadvertently, are requirements for businesses to take action that help sustain and develop the rule of law and democratic institutions. And this phenomenon is, not, is occurring at precisely the time that democracies are weakening globally. So just as ESG investing is booming, democratic institutions and the rule of law is weakening. And so it's my great hope that more workshops like this one will help our community, the democracy community, connect to the ESG investing community. It's a complicated subject, but we've got a panel here that I think is gonna dig in and, and spread out a bit and help everybody understand what the potentials are. And I can't think of a better person to kick off today's effort in that direction than my colleague, Michelle Crimes, will be our moderator today. At SIPE, Michelle is the ESG coordinator. She's also an attorney who specializes in anti-corruption and compliance investigations. She brings real world experience to the discussion about developing and adhering to ESG standards. Michelle is a native of Milwaukee in Wisconsin and a graduate of the Wisconsin Law School. I'm happy to turn things over to her to introduce our hybrid panel. Michelle? Thank you so much for that really uh, nice welcome, Frank. Um, before I get started, just to the forum staff, I'm getting pinged by my staff back in Washington, D.C. that the Zoom hasn't started, so there might be a hiccup there. If you could kindly uh, start the Zoom, we would appreciate it. We'd love to have our uh, guests who are here virtually with us. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and hosting this panel um, and really dig into a bit of a discussion about why multinationals, rule of law, and ESG communities um, sort of are relevant to each other and how they might be able to help each other. Uh, I attended a session yesterday on how to engage business in transforming governance. I see a few familiar faces here, so good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm hoping that this session might be an opportunity for us to sort of dig into a how mechanism, sort of how we might approach it, how we might start to engage in the process together. Um, I'm excited to be joined by ESG thought leaders, uh, members of academia, and of course, leaders from the private sector. Uh, just very quickly, our panel today is, uh, I'll be joined by Andrea Bonme Blanc, Klaus Musmier, Robin Willing, and John Stout. Andrea will be the first to go in our panelists today, and I hope that you will find the information that she shares to be engaging. Um, before I turn things over to Andrea, 
um, I sort of want to explain why I think sort of there's this connection between what I would call justice community, democracy community, rule of law, and sort of these ESG standards. Um, I think these are two communities that don't talk together very uh, often. I think that was something that I saw in the panel yesterday, that I, uh, the working group that I attended yesterday. The big question was, how do we engage? How do we have a conversation? And I think that sometimes the business community also wonders, how do we engage? How do we have a conversation? So this will really be an opportunity for us to start to think about that. Um, I'd now like to turn things over to um, Andrea. Um, she is the founder and CEO of GES. GEC Risk Advisory, um, which is a strategic governance, risk, reputation, and ethics advising uh, company. Uh, she was going to sort of help us understand the evolution of ESG. It's not something, of course, that's brand new. I think it's just something that is very much in the forefront of our minds at the moment. And so with that, I hope that I will be turning things over to Andrea, who is joining us via Zoom. If you wouldn't mind, let's have Andrea. Can, okay, I think I see myself. I see you as well. <laughs> uh, good Welcome. afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be here remotely and uh, delighted to be part of such a wonderful panel. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, uh, uh, Frank, for, for the invitation. Um, I do have a PowerPoint slide, which I hope will be um, visible to everyone and to myself, because I would like to be able to uh, give you the instructions to move forward. So. Um, with that, uh, if you want to just put my PowerPoint slide up, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to get started with a very broad, big picture overview uh, of where ESG fits in the democracy and rule of law discussion. And basically what I've tried to do in this slide, which is very busy, but it, it's something I'm happy to share with folks if they want to see it uh, in greater detail. I'm really trying to paint a picture here about the three things that I think are really intertwined and interconnected. And that is democratic governance, also you know, rule of law obviously is part of that. Uh, the whole field of ethics and compliance that has arisen over the last 20, 30 years, even 35 years. And then the whole sustainability and ESG uh, world, which we're talking about and focusing on here today. Um, in my opinion, this is, these are developments that have been taking place over the last 50 years or so, you'll see that the timeline that I've covered in this slide is 1970s to, uh, to, to today, basically. And I've tried to put in some of the major markers of developments in democratic governance, ethics and compliance, and sustainability and ESG. Um, what I would like to suggest is that all of these are intertwined, interconnected, interrelated. They talk to each other, they influence each other, and they basically, um, it, it, have have real uh, sort of Venn diagram kind of content. Um, you will see from a democratic governance standpoint, we went from uh, having fewer democracies 50 years ago to a real surge in democracies over the last 30 to 40 years, and then a decline in the last 15 or so years. In the case of ethics and compliance, we had the whole world of um, anti-corruption, giving it a kickstart back in the 70s then more in the 80s, then the OECD, Transparency International, and all the countries that have uh, adopted FCPA-like laws, influencing the ethics and compliance space. And now we're to, to a point where multinationals and the, uh, the governments around the world um, are you know, putting together ethics and compliance programs and also enforcing. And then in the case of sustainability and ESG, we have the Milton Friedman definition of shareholder capitalism that uh, occurred in the 1970s, um, then slowly but surely transforming into uh, stakeholder capitalism, which is a term that we're using a lot today. And under that rubric of stakeholder capitalism are all the things that we've been talking about and developing over this last 30 or so years in terms of uh, the kinds of metrics, the kinds of frameworks for measuring environmental health, safety, uh, social governance, um, the UN Global Compact, the, the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, um, all of these different things, and then the SASB measures and other metrics, this has all been developing and moving in the last uh, few years. So what I would suggest is go to the next slide, please. And I just want to give a, a sort of a broader overview, which is that in the last 50 years or so, we've seen these, um, these 
trends and mega trends taking place where ethics and ESG has really risen in importance. Uh, and we're now at a point where we have very developed ethics and compliance programs and sustainability and ESG programs um, in, uh, in, in certainly in the business world, but also the government um, and something we're calling stakeholder capitalism. Um, and then we have the decline of democracy over the last 15 or so years. So we're kind of in this place where democracy is at risk, rule of law is at risk, um, but we are seeing this, this increase in uh, consciousness, responsibility when it comes to environmental issues, climate issues, social issues. So if we go to the next slide, I just wanna do a quicker deep dive real quick into uh, the nuances of each of these trends. So here you have um, uh, pictures, graphics uh, from The Economist and The World in Data, as well as Freedom House, which I'm sure everyone is very familiar with. And the, the decline in democracy that I was referring to is really something that's happened uh, as documented by Freedom House, which as all of you know, uh, does a really deep dive into all the different criteria that define democracy. And we've seen a steady decline over the last 16 years that they've been measuring this in uh, the uh, democracies around the world, and also an, an increase in uh, illiberal democracy, what uh, the other uh, graphic, which has the, the four colors shows, an increase in electoral autocracies, um, a decline in closed autocracies are the most a serious form of authoritarianism and lack of rule of law, but an increase in electoral autocracies, which have been eating into uh, electoral democracies and liberal democracies, which are the most um, democratic forms of government, let's say. So let's go to the next slide, please, where I do have a couple of additional uh, graphics about the democracy around the world and, and its decline. And here you have, again, a graphic uh, that shows those four different categories of, uh, of regime uh, in a map. Uh, so the light blue is, is um, electoral uh, democracies, the dark blue is liberal democracies, red is um, autocracies, closed autocracies, and yellow is um, electoral uh, autocracies. And so you can see also in the, in the right-hand graphic um, the number of people who live in uh, non um, uh, liberal or democratic states, and that has increased uh, over the last uh, uh, decade or two as well. Uh, eight out of 10 people do not live in liberal democracies. So this is um, a really serious series of developments that has absolute uh, reflection of and impact on uh, rule of law issues. Let's move to the next slide, please. And here I have uh, a couple of slides that talk about the the rise of sustainability and ESG. And if we look at the arc of, of, of this uh, development, uh, we've gone from shareholder being king or queen, I guess, uh, shareholders uh, being the be all end all of capitalism to now talking about multiple stakeholders. We're talking about the workers, we're talking about communities, we're talking about the environmental issues, we're talking about other important stakeholders in the discussion about business and society. Uh, and that, of course, has major impacts on laws, on regulations, et cetera. And so here you see Just Capital, which is an NGO in the United States that looks at publicly traded companies in the US and ranks them for best treatment of stakeholders. Uh, so they uh, basically look at five groups of stakeholders and their most important issues. And if you just look at the orange, those are the workers' um, issues. Uh, so. Uh, Basically, one of the, the, the statements a lot of companies are making is that their most important stakeholder is the worker, not the shareholder, the worker. If you treat the worker well, uh, everything else will follow. That's one of the quotes uh, made years ago by Howard Schultz, the, the founder and CEO of Starbucks. If you treat the worker well, then the customer will be treated well, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go to the next slide, please. And this really just tries to show you again, this evolution in the ESG and sustainability uh, uh, space of um, actual shareholder democracy, if you wanna call it that, within companies. So that's another sort of uh, trend that has been happening where more and more uh, uh, activist shareholders and others, uh, asset managers, uh, the big ones like BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street and others 
are pushing harder and harder for resolutions and, and uh, proxy uh, statements on environmental issues, social issues, and governance issues. So you can see that uh, there are a bunch of different, it's very hard to see from, from afar, I'm sure, but you'll see if you get a chance to look at the slide that we're talking about um, climate issues that have been presented uh, to corporations during the proxy season. We're talking about diversity issues. We're talking about human rights issues. Again, all of these interconnect with the rule of law and, and uh, you know, the, the, the whole set of issues that we talk about in uh, democracy and rule of law and in um, anti-corruption as well. Uh, shareholder resolutions, as you can see from this economist uh, graph, have gone up very substantially. Uh, since 2013 to 2022, you can see uh, a, at least 50% increase in shareholder resolutions. And then another uh, graphic, which is a slightly out of date because we've had a major market uh, uh, sort of uh, correction, I guess, in the last month or so. But the funds that are going into um, ESG and, and socially responsible investment in both the bond and the equity markets have been rising substantially and this is just a graph from the last uh, four years. So this continues to, to increase. There's a lot of influence and a lot of uh, discussion about this, uh, but it also has a major reflection on, uh, on, on the whole rule of law issue and the interconnection of business and government. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, I'll have a couple of thoughts here uh, on the ethics and compliance piece. So we talked about democratic governance. We talked about ESG and sustainability. And now I have a couple of slides to sort of show some of the developments in the ethics and compliance space. Again, starting way back in the 70s with the first anti-corruption uh, extraterritorial law, the FCPA, developing over time into what we call the effective ethics and compliance programs, um, and also the regulatory and the enforcement uh, arms of government, rule of law again. Um, looking at what companies are claiming about uh, being, you know, ethical. And so we have a lot of div different developments here, but I just wanted to illustrate some. Uh, just Capital, for example, does a ranking of the most just companies each year. And they look at all of these stakeholder issues. They have about 19 issues, five different stakeholder groups, and they then rank the companies based on what they find in their publicly available documents. And then you have ethical companies, which is something that's been going on for a while too, just trying to uh, measure uh, how ethical a company is and it, it can backfire, it can go both ways, uh, but they have some graphs that show that those companies that have received this accreditation um, have a higher premium in terms of their actual uh, return than companies that don't. Uh, take it for what it's, uh, what it's worth. Um, it could mean something or it could just be that it's a self-selected group of companies. If we go to the next slide, just to finish up on the ethics and compliance piece, um, this is just, again, the, the counterpart. So we talked about ethics and compliance programs, building companies, talking about them, companies claiming things about them. Well, now the enforcement and regulatory regimes are also looking at those claims. And the same thing is happening, by the way, with ESG. We just had a couple of major developments in Europe um, in the last uh, few, few days, as well here, as here in the US, um, about greenwashing claims. Uh, here we had a company that was fined uh, in Germany yesterday, our day before yesterday, we had um, the uh, investment wing of, uh, of Deutsche Bank raided um, for greenwashing allegations. So we have the governments getting much more proactive. In the United States, we also have the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, passing, uh, proposing a very major change in climate disclosure. So we have the regulators, we have the, the enforcers looking at these claims, not only in the ethics and compliance space, but now increasingly also in the sustainability ESG, what we call greenwashing space. So let's go to the next slide where I think this sort of interconnection that I'm talking about between democratic governance, ethics and compliance, and ESG and sustainability is really very, very starkly and, um, and importantly um, uh, represented in, in this case study uh, of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where suddenly uh, it's certainly democratic governance versus non-democratic governance, but it's also um, silver linings. This is a, a quote from Freedom House's uh, executive director, 
uh, Abramovitz, where he, he thinks that this could be a turning point for democracy. You saw that decline over 16 years that his organization has uh, documented. He actually said right after the, um, the invasion of Russia that this could be a turning point for democracy to, to start coming back a little bit. I think we should suspend our disbelief, but I think uh, this is a potentially important turning point uh, that has just been brought to the fore by this uh, aggressive war that we see in, in Ukraine and by the Ukrainian people's response, their leaders' response, representing the values of democracy and rule of law that, uh, that we're all talking about. Um, we also have the interconnection with the business sector here. Uh, this is a, an editorial that Natalie Jereska, former Minister of Finance of Ukraine, wrote for the FT in which she basically uh, talked about how the invasion of Ukraine should prompt an ESG reckoning. Um, and then you have the Yale School of Management list that has been propagated over the last uh, three months showing what companies have left Russia and which ones remain. And it's become this name and shame and um, you know, very proactive um, uh, set of, of uh, conversations and accusations and reputational issues that companies are having to deal with if they want to stay in Russia uh, or employ people in Russia, keep their assets, et cetera. So this is just an illustration of how I think all of these things are intertwining, the ESG, the compliance, the ethics, and the rule of law. Uh, next slide is just a, a quick uh, uh, sort of final thought on this, which is that I think that democracy, ethics, and sustainability share a lot of DNA. Uh, so I think that's why, you know, with more democracy, we, we have the potential for greater business responsibility, more enforcement that is transparent and uh, equitable, objective. So I think these things kind of move together. And uh, so I thought the strand of DNA might, might illustrate that. And then the next slide, I just throw out a few questions that I think we should think about as we go forward. Um, we, I think we are at a turning point on a lot of these things. Uh, it's been a perfect storm. We thought it was, it was over as, pan as the pandemic was starting to be controlled somewhat. Uh, but then we have a war and we have supply chain risk and we have potential humanitarian uh, disasters, hunger, et cetera. So we, we are at a, another turning point, I would say. And ESG and, and ethics and compliance play a central role in interconnecting business society and government on these biggest of issues. And that's why I think something like ESG is here to stay, whether we call it ESG or we call it sustainability. And I think the nomenclature issues are important, but the arc of uh, the arc of the moral universe as Martin Luther King and, and Obama uh, said um, a few years back, uh, the arc of the moral universe uh, is long, but it bends towards justice. And I would say it bends towards um, uh, ethics and democracy and sustainability because we really don't have a choice um, because these issues are global issues that we need to tackle. Um, the war uh, that Putin has started uh, has, uh, potential improvement uh, implications for democracy, as you heard from that quote from Abramovitz. Um, it may not have it uh, globally, but certainly in some of the Western nations that have been struggling, uh, my own included. And then we also have stakeholders that are looking more and more to business for relief on environmental issues and social issues. That's not going away. And business itself has become polarized on this issue. So we have a lot of moving pieces and they all involve ethics, sustainability, and democracy. Let me leave you with one last thought. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is a piece that just was published last week that I, <clears throat> that I uh, uh, write and publish every year, which is looking at the ESG and I added T for technology, the, the environmental, social governance, and technology megatrends for the next year. And in that, uh, I, I use a lot of the data that I showed you on, this, on these slides uh, and, and a lot more to sort of think about where are we going and how do leaders navigate those important issues. And they all involve democratic governance, rule of law, environmental, social, and governance. And they also involve the idea of technological disruption, which I think is a core component of what we're talking about. So we have geopolitical tectonic shifts that are catalyzing with this Ukraine war. We have the climate issues and the war propelling what I call complex interconnected risk. 
which is really the supply chain, the worldwide inflation, um, uh, humanitarian crises, et cetera. Uh, we have tech disruption becoming multidimensional, which is it's going beyond the dimensions we're familiar with into crypto, into metaverse, into quantum. Uh, stakeholder and cap capitalism and ESG are intertwining, and this is most of what I've talked about today. And then finally, leadership and institutional trust recalibrating. There's been a decline in leadership trust as documented by the Edelman Trust Barometer and others um, over the last 10 to 15 years as well. I think with the example of uh, President Zelensky and a few other leaders, we're starting to see maybe a little bit of a change, recalibration of that kind of leadership that we need in government, in business, and in society. So with that, I'll stop now. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share these thoughts and uh, looking forward to hearing from my panel, co-panelists on, on this great panel. Fantastic, thank you so much, um, Andrea. I always appreciate hearing from you on this topic. Uh, I work a bit with Andrea and I really do find most of her work uh, very fascinating. I think one of the important things to sort of take away from what she's just sort of talked about for us is that interconnection, right? That there is a nexus between ESG, what businesses are actually engaging in in their communities. And I think one of the important things that we'll talk about next as we hear from Klaus is that businesses are part of a community. Uh, they don't exist without the people from a community who work at them. And uh, where you know, people go to work, they go to school, right? Businesses are part of the community. So I think part of our discussion yesterday was, well, how do we bring them to account? Um, we are, as part of this panel, uh, trying to talk about the fact that businesses are becoming more multidimensional and they understand that they're part of the community. Um, I, before I go on to our next panelist, I do want to say that we will have Q&A afterwards in my rush to sort of get past our tech issues. I forgot to mention that there is a microphone that's set up here uh, with you, the guest, and it seems that our uh, guests who are with us via Zoom are with, have been able to join us, so we'll be taking questions after each of our panelists speak. So thank you so much, Andrea. It's always a pleasure to interact with you, and I'm going to uh, move on to our next panelist, uh, Klaus. Uh, he is the chief ethics and risk compliance officer at Nova Artist. Uh, he's really led the way uh, at Simmons as an AG where he spent 18 years. And he's going to give us an, his insight into the role that anti-corruption policy sort of plays as part of ESG. He'll also sort of give us some of his insights into some of the positive impact that uh, policies can have on democratic institutions and law. So we will now um, hear from Klaus. Fantastic. Uh, Michelle, and um, glad to be with you, although only virtual. I hope you can uh, see and understand me well. It was a beautiful, I mean, segue by, by Andrea to, uh, to pick, give you the, the big uh, frame on, on ESG. I want to uh, structure my, my intervention in three points. So first of all, a little bit of practical view on ESG from a, a company perspective. Uh, how do you implement ESG? What is the specifics for my industry, the pharmaceutical industry? And how is the landscape from all point of view? Just coming back from the World Economic Forum last week, and just had yesterday another B20 chair call um, under the G20 of Indonesia on also e, um, ESG, so a lot of insights there. And second, um, as Michelle said, the specific topic of anti-corruption in ESG, which uh, I would say was not in the focus of the public discussion so far. And then uh, third and last, the topic of democracy and, and how do we put this into, into the picture. As a company which has to serve patients, uh, roughly 800 million patients in the world, which are not living all in, in democracies. So first on, on ESG, I mean, I fully agree with Andrea, ESG is here to stay and, and rightfully, rightfully so. What we face at the moment, of course, is a, a total, I would say, empire of different standards, rating agencies, different views of, of investors, how to do this. But this will be sorted out. I'm, I'm pretty sure that this whole ESG universe will be regulated over time. And it's like with ethics overall, you know, the ethical, ethical challenges and questions of today are the laws and the compliance regulations of tomorrow. We saw this very classically, for example, in the space of human rights. 
how to implement this in the company. So, you know, it's, it's very similar to a classical compliance program implementation. It all starts with the tone from the top. So to make this very clear, if you don't get your CEO and your board really fully engaged as an active party, not as a passive listener into the discussion implementation, if you don't get this done, this will potentially not work because to implement ESG, you need impact in the company. You need data. One of the big topics is because you want to measure, you want to have KPIs. You need data and you only get the full data set and the full impact if you have the full commitment by top management. So what we did, for example, example at Novartis, we have at our level of the executive committee, where I'm a member, we have a trust reputation committee chaired by the CEO. And we are discussing on a regular basis all the ESG topics. We have an ESG office and an ESG council for the businesses, but we have the executive committee and our CEO and our board, we have an own ESG committee as well, has uh, the full strategy and, and management oversight um, over this. So that's, that's, I believe, is important. Then secondly, you of course have to uh, fulfill the growing expectations of society and we are part of society on all on all relevant points of ESG, on the E, on the E pillar, on the S pillar, on the G pillar. But you, you can't be leading everywhere. And it would be not honest to say as a company, I'm leading everywhere in all ESG topics. So you have to do an impact assessment. You can also call it materiality, materiality assessment. And uh, this means you have to be a good corporate citizen fulfilling the growing expectation of society in all matters, but then focus your ambition on the topics where you have the biggest impact as a company and as part of society. So in, in our case, it's clearly access to medicine for patients and ethical standards. So these are the topics which also clearly came out in our materiality assessment where we involved external stakeholders on a very broad ba base, including uh, academia and civil society. These are the topics where we need to focus on access to medicine, and this leaves you also then, or brings you also, of course, given the actual political situation in, in very heavy ethical questions and sometimes dilemmas. I mean, if you look at the Ukraine-Russia war situation, the war against Ukraine, we are fully committed to support Ukraine with all the power we had, and we did a lot there. But we also have patients in Russia. And access to medicine is a human right. So all the discussion of which companies should leave Russia and which companies maybe have an ethical, an ethical mandate to stay in Russia to uh, to still get access to medicine for our patients there, is a topic we discuss on this ESG committee, the Trust Reputation Committee as well. But you can only do this on really on the highest level of the company. If not, your ESG program is simply a window dressing. Second anti-corruption. We all know how to implement a compliance management system, but how, how can we report about this in, uh, in uh, the framework of ESG? Personally, I believe that anti-corruption, as this is also a cultural, a social topic, is more towards the S pillar of ESG. It's not only a, a governance topic, it's a social topic. And I come to this also in my third point in a talk, how can we use democracies and the associate base to, to create their awareness. So we see it more in the, in the S pillar of, of ESG. And what we try to do to make this tangible is a, a true collective action. And this was triggered by one relevant party of ESG by an investor. So uh, Norges Investment Bank Norges Bank Investment Management, better said, one of the biggest investors globally, they, uh, they hosted a kind of roundtable workshop of companies, of pharmaceutical companies to develop jointly key performance indicators and ways how to report under ESG standards on anti-bribing efforts of the company. And this is then more than just, do you have a compliance organization? Do you have trainings? Do you investigate? It's also about culture. It's about communication. Who communicates about the fight against corruption? And how do you get 
your associates, your employees in the companies involved? And are you also outside your company borders uh, active and participating in collective action? And we jointly then on August, uh, bank investment management then published together with the Basel Institute of Governance, uh, which was coordinating the work as a think tank, a guidance paper. And after a Bristol Myers Squibb, we were the second company to publish recently our ESG paper on how to implement and report very specifically on anti-corruption work in a company and including, for example, the cultural topic the employee engagements and the communication we do in the company. So you need tangible examples for anti-corruption work under ESG to make this understandable to the broader society. If it's just a buzzword, the people will potentially not buy in. Now to the third point, democracy. And that's, and it's, I think we, we have here a psychological safety in this room. That's a difficult topic also for companies, especially in the pharmaceutical sector. As I said, our purpose of our company of the industry is access to, to provide access to medicine to patients around the globe. We are reaching nearly 1 billion patients on, on this globe. So we can't make a distinction. These are good patients, bad patients. They're only patients. If they live in a democracy or not live in a democracy. That means you have to provide your associates, your employees in the company, and also your suppliers and your third parties with the instruments uh, to uh, really make ethical challenges, challenges, which we have always from early research over development, manufacturing, uh, and selling our products across the whole life cycle to make these ethical dilemmas at least transparent and create psychological safety to discuss them. So how, how can we do this in companies and with society? So just think about the basic values of democracy. This is co-creation, get people involved, get people voting, get people heard. So when we, when we launched our code of ethics in the middle of the pandemic, we had involved nearly the whole workforce of Novartis, 100,000 people in the one way or the other way in voting on the code of ethics and getting them involved into the, in the virtual discussion houses about our ethical commitments, to talk about ethical dilemmas, where a solution is difficult, but if, if you can discuss it at least, if you give the employees the possibilities to bring topics up, and again, we are not perfect, it's not a paradise. We are living in a real world and have to make decisions in real time. These are not always the right decisions, but to give the associates the security and the tools this is also, I believe, uh, a really a democratic value we can adapt in companies. Although we have to operate in environments which are not always following democratic rules, but we can at least provide the, the groundwork and the rules and the standards to come to a good decision making. So having said this, I want to hand back to Michelle and looking forward to hear from the other panelists about their approach. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Klaus. Um, I think one of the things that really sticks out from what he just said is sort of wanting ESG to be more than uh, window dressing. And I hope that sort of through the examples and the sort of the way that Klaus has sort of laid out for you, the way that um, Novartis is approaching some of these issues, you can understand that it even it, for a business, it's a complex issue uh, that, as you've said, you don't always make the right decisions, but you make the best decisions that uh, can be made. And so we're hoping that through this sort of conversation, we can continue to understand really how uh, businesses are viewing uh, this particular issue. I'm now going to turn to our one of our in-person panelists, uh, I think who will give us a little bit more color about sort of what this all means. Um, I'd like to introduce Robin Willing. Uh, he currently serves as the Director of, Sustain of Sustainability at NIBC Bank, uh, which is based here in the Netherlands. Uh, he is a financial services and sustainability professional with more than 25 years of managerial experience in this area. And he's going to give us a little bit of insight on NIBC's role and Netherlands responsible uh, business agreement and I hope give us sort of more of a local understanding of what ESG issues mean. Robin, over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Robin. I'm responsible for sustainability at one of the Dutch banks, NIBC. Um, I, I liked hearing from Klaus just now because uh, everything he was saying certainly resonates, um, resonates with me. 
different point of view and different scale, I would say, um, but it, it certainly rings true uh, for us. In case you're not familiar with us, um, we're a mid-sized bank based here in the Netherlands. We're actually the sixth largest, I think, here in the Netherlands, a balance sheet of about 22 billion, which sounds big, um, but, but in the scheme of uh, finance, it's small. <laughs> um, we, uh, we serve both uh, corporate and retail customers, and we have a bit of a unique history in that um, NIBC was started at the end of the Second World War and uh, with a main purpose of helping to rebuild the Dutch economy and financial resilience. So interesting sort of development uh, mission at the start. Today we're a commercial bank, but, but that origin as, um, uh, as uh, uh, development bank really forms part of the corporate culture. It still rings a bit true um, today. And I think entrepreneurialism and inventiveness are two of our corporate values, and you see how that might carry forward from those origins. Our headquarters is actually directly across from the street from the Peace Palace, so some of you may have come by it on, on the way over here, where the UN was founded. We actually have a bit of a unique bond in, with the UN in that both of us were formed within a few weeks of each other. So uh, something, something quite unique for, for this financial institution. Our headquarters was built actually on the location of a former bomb crater, uh, which was the result of an allied bombing raid on a building there, uh, well, that was previously, previously there, which was used by the Nazis to identify Jews and take their passports. Um, wow, you know, that sounds, sounds uh, like something. I think if you don't mind, rather than giving, giving a real presentation, I'd like to tell a couple of stories, because I think you're already getting the sense that I want to tell a few stories, and my, my, my fellow panelists are itching for me to tell a story or two, so, so that's what I'll do. Um, uh, the financial sector has, has a real responsibility to uphold justice, strengthen the rule of law, um, and, and build societal resilience. It's in, our, it's in our DNA. Financial markets prefer legal certainty, clear definitions, transparency, and this isn't really different for ESG as it is for financial topics and even where they intersect. A few years ago, I represented NIBC in the Responsible Business Conduct Agreement for the banking sector here in the Netherlands and, and various working groups which were formed with um, peer banks, civil society organizations, unions, and national authorities. So pretty unique uh, collaboration. We focused primarily on human rights, um, exploring various case studies um, that, that discuss the practical application of the UN, uh, the UN guiding principles and OECD guidelines in, in, in banks and financial institutions. Um, the outcomes are actually publicly available. They were published in a series of papers which are on the Socioeconomisch Rod SER uh, website here in the Netherlands. Um, one of the working groups that I was involved in um, explored grievance and remedy so that's actually a pretty sensitive topic for, for banks, um, but it's a core component of both the UNGPs and OECD guidelines. One of the main conclusions what, was that more was needed to build up and strengthen what we were calling the ecosystem for justice and inclusion. Um, the, the agreement itself and the working groups um, uh, finished up a couple of years ago, so, uh, so that's now in the rearview mirror a little bit, but one of the questions we've been asking ourselves is how do we continue to make progress? How do we achieve uh, a, democ uh, a democracy dividend or a democratic dividend? Um, the, the banks have actually continued to carry this forward in various working groups within the Dutch Banking Association. So not in the public eye and maybe not with that, with that same um, uh, group of stakeholders, but that interaction continues. Um, behind the scenes, we've been actually advocating for a strong alignment of EU ESG regulation um, with the OECD guidelines and UNGPs. So don't make it different, make it the same. Um, that makes it actually easier for us. So going back to that clarity, transparency, et cetera, uh, those aspects. Um, and though, really though we're sort of inching towards this, this dividend, um, the many discussions all of you have been 
part of here in the, here in the World uh, Justice Forum. The pace needs to rapidly accelerate. We're only inching forward right now. Um, let me give a, a, a live example of this. Uh, a few days ago, I was, I was discussing the upcoming EU um, corporate, corporate uh, um, sustainability reporting directive, or CSRD, with, with peer banks and some other, some other stakeholders in an industry-wide uh, forum. One of the challenges, and this goes back to Klaus's uh, presentation a little bit, was, was uh, the differing interpretations of materiality. What's material? Um, for example, should materiality really be determined from the point of view of the business, i.e. maybe purely financial materiality, if it has a financial impact at all? Or should it be from a more inclusive point of view, so that of the affected stakeholders or potential affected stakeholders? Um, interesting. Uh, uh, to say the least. Um, I know all of you probably in the room know the, an the right answer already, but, uh, but actually in the, in the legal text of the, of the current regulation, it's actually quite vague. Um, and therefore, it's being read differently by experts which don't actually have a detailed understanding of the UNGPs or OECD guidelines. Um, I probably don't need to say that I hope that some of you will respond to the ongoing consultations on this to ensure that the wording becomes a bit more precise and directly, um, directly aligned. That would help us. But I think it's important that you know kind of what's happening behind the scenes, even if we don't always say it out loud. On, on maybe a more positive note, I want to give you an example of some progress at the same time. Um, like most banks, we have a relatively well-developed sustainability framework. It includes a sustainability policy, um, a human rights policy, a climate and environment policy, and, and others. Um, in our latest annual report, um, we mention climate resilience and business ethics um, as material topics for NIBC. Um, and one area where this comes together really is is about ensuring a just climate transition. Um, that's something that I feel quite, uh, quite passionate about. The, the OECD guard, guidelines, Paris Agreement targets, UNGPs are really at the center of our, of our policy approach and, and, and our, our uh, ESG strategy. We, we perform human rights due diligence. We perform environmental due diligence to the best of our ability. This all sounds nice, but of course we're not perfect. And I think uh, we report on this pretty well in our annual report, and we, we mention where we've succeeded and where we've struggled, so where we need to improve and, and deepen this work. Um, so we can continue to collaborate, we continue to learn, we continue to share, and, um, and we hope that we'll be able to continue to refine and improve our due diligence and monitoring processes, because that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, importantly, we do reflect on societal views, um, public sentiment, and in, develop in developing our approach. Uh, we engage regularly and openly. I mean, I won't, I'm telling you the same thing I'd speak about um, internally as well, so, so really open book um, with our stakeholders to make sure that we take a well-informed approach which is applied as consistently as I possibly can across our business. Um, and and in, in the lead up to COP26, just to go towards an example, um, civil society, youth, communities affected by the impacts of global warming were openly calling out the financial sector on their net zero commitments. Hmm. How credible is it? Um, rightly so. How can they be credible if um, same time as we're, we're making these commitments at the same time as increasing investments into oil and gas. We should be called out. Um, as, de as deforestation is accelerating, as CO2 levels continue to rise, we should get called out. It's pretty obvious. Um, so during COP26, um, uh, we updated our policies to actually stop financings of oil and gas. Um, sadly, <laughs> I think we are or were um, the only, only the second equator principles bank, so ones that were involved in, in uh, project finance um, over the years to do so so far globally. Um, but I'm proud to say we've done it. 
um, and I, I stand behind it even with what's been going back, it, happening recently in the, in, the, um, in the public space, the war in Ukraine, et cetera, because we need to take these steps if we're really gonna make this transition and make it count. Um, but but uh, it really reflects actions and a bit of, of daringness, which began about four or five years ago, when this really would have been seen as, as leading, because that's actually when we stopped originating new oil and gas deals. We didn't say it in the public space. It would have sounded very hollow at the moment because we still had a pretty sizable um, portfolio. But it began around the same time as the Dutch Climate Agreement, which, uh, which we signed here in the Netherlands for the financial sector. And it's probably something that we'll, uh, we'll report on in, in our upcoming um, TCFD report, which we also, which we also do. Um, I think I'll stop there because uh, the path forward for the financial sector in particular is not an easy one. Um, all of us can take a more active role, make more balanced choices, risk-based choices, uh, well-informed choices, which include the perspective of those who are affected or could be affected by, uh, it, by things if we don't act today. Um, implementation is challenging and does take time. I think our own example shows it. Um, and particularly if you're looking at other institutions, I would guess that's about the timeline you can expect from the moment you commit to um, ending oil and gas finance to the moment that you're truly getting out of it. Um, it, it takes that long if you're making these choices. Um, but justice is achievable. A democratic dividend will become increasingly visible if we all do work together. Um, building this ecosystem. I'm quite honored to be here with all of you today and, and with this group of panelists, so wanted to just um, thank all of you for that, and on behalf of my colleagues, thanks for your work. So back to you, Michelle. Thank you so much for that. I think the important thing that, as we were sort of talking about what, you know, planning panels, as I'm sure many of you have done in this room, and having discussions about why, why ESG, why, why is this important, and I always sort of, Robin was the first person that we spoke to, and as you can see, he really understands this issue. And part of the reason I'm connected to this, I think Frank mentioned that I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which if you know where that is, <laughs> it's north of Chicago about an hour. But I'm, what he didn't mention is that I'm from, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities, right, in America, actually, believe it or not, this medium-sized city in the Midwest, and I grew up on the north side where it's, it's very segregated. My parents are what you would consider either working class or even poor working class. And it's through the justice system that I was able to get a really strong education. Uh, Milwaukee was, uh, and its nearby suburbs were forced to integrate, right? So I was able to access a certain type of education, which means that I get to stand here before you today and talk about this issue and advocate for this issue. Um, I wanted to make that connection because we're going to turn over to our next panelist, uh, John Stout. Um, he and I also had this conversation about how rule of law really underlies everything sort of that, that um, touches ESG. And I really want for you to hear from him. Um, John practices um, in business organizations, finance and governance uh, for Fredrickson and Bryan PA which is a Minneapolis-based uh, firm, uh, which means that he's also in the Midwest, so that's fantastic. Um, he is a former member of the Board of Directors for the National Associations of Corporate Directors, and he's a co-founder of the Minnesota chapter. Uh, he has also sat on SIPE's Board of Trustees, uh, and he is also a member of the uh, ABA Rowley, if I get it proper, if I say it properly, the International Law uh, committee, and it's part of the reason why he is here as well today. He's part of this forum in, I think, a much broader um, context, but we're so happy to have you on our panel today, and so I'm going to turn it over to you for a few remarks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hi. Uh, I want to talk about three things quickly. One is, and build on some of the things that the other panelists have talked about, and I like um, your finishing with the challenge there. That, And I think um, I want to talk about a challenge that we all face. Let's just talk about sustainability for a minute. For me, sustainability is packed with 
a number of provocative subjects. And it, it kind of led us into where we are right now. And it started, I think, the biggest push came from the investor community, some of the big funds, and they focused on um, environmental challenges, climate change, carbon, those kinds of things, and they pushed hard. And I think they, they really got this train rolling well. But sustainability for me is, is yes, ESG, um, and then it's corporate social responsibility, the CSR, which I think is, is quite important because the C, um, I think, resolved for a lot of people the debate about the purpose of corporations, and uh, it's pretty clear when you dwell on or drill down on corporate social responsibility because many of the elements of sustainability um, are fitting within the subject of corporate social responsibility and companies continue to address them. So after CSR, uh, you often find DE and I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you know the challenges we have there. If you go back to the G and ESG, um, board and management composition, big challenges in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion that, that corporations are starting to grapple with in a meaningful way. So CSR for me is a big deal. It also helps focus on the billions of dollars we've lost through failures of corporate integrity over the last few um, years. And uh, so it gives us an opportunity to address the issue of integrity as we look at corruption and subjects like that. DE&I is also the human piece of that sustainability continuum, right? The diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, and uh, that's a significant piece that's getting a lot of um, deserved attention as part of this continuum because if we don't get that right, we have big time societal sustainability issues and, uh, and those won't go away without us addressing them. And then the last couple of elements that you usually hear packed into the sustainability continuum would be um, human rights and social justice. The missing piece, which is the second thing I want to mention, is the rule of law. You don't hear the rule of law packed into the sustainability continuum in the common discussions. And it needs to be there. I mean, the issue of the decline in the rule of law, this is why I love what the World Justice Project is doing and helping us focus on with its index and all. Look, the decline in the rule of law has to stop and it has to be reversed, right? It affects every one of the sustainability elements. If you like ESG and, some, and the other elements, fine. ESG is packed with laws and regulations. And uh, uh, as the rule of law declines, so will the energy behind and the impact behind some of the elements of sustainability, um, most of the elements of sustainability. I mean, it's so interconnected. So the, what I am hoping is that we'll begin to look at the rule of law from the perspective of societal sustainability, very much into will we maintain our society and democracy and all of that to the degree that we want to. My last comment is on who's responsible. And at the, pro, not the last plenary, but the one before that, the speaker talked about how, you know, we stand on the shoulders of people who brought us this far. 
which, which we clearly do um, at this conference and on these issues. And um, so from the standpoint of who's responsible, it's really us as citizens. It really makes a difference what we vote for and who we vote for and where we put our energy and our money. It's also about lawyers and the legal profession. As, as a member of that profession, um, we have in some ways, look, in all of our rules of professional responsibility, I think across um, other countries, but certainly in the United States, the American Bar Association principles of professional responsibility, all of the states have rules of professional responsibility. All of those rules say that it's the job of lawyers to stand for and support the rule of law. And my personal view is that we as a profession and we as members of that profession have to step up our game. We're not doing a, as, as good a job as the rules um, require. So it's on citizens, it's really on the profession that's about law, and it's also on business. Business, as we know, absolutely depends on a strong rule of law. We want a good economy, strong rule of law. We want to attract businesses from around the world to come here and start here and individuals, talented individuals to come here and grow here, rule of law. So it's on all of us and uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity to say these things to you and I also appreciate the uh, Center for uh, Private International Private Enterprise for giving me the opportunity to say these things and also again the World Justice Project for convening us all. Now we have time, Michelle, right, for some Q&A, so let's have it. Thank you so much. If we could please um, have both Klaus and Andrea up on the screen so that uh, our people who are with us uh, can see them. And we'd ha be happy to take um, any questions that you might have. And um, so there's a microphone, please do feel free to queue up. If not, I will just say that that's, I'll just make one quick comment and say this is one of the reasons that I was very happy to have uh, John on the, on the panel, because this is something that I believe in very, very deeply. I've already sort of shared my personal understanding of why it's important, and I think he brought it, uh, I think gave great examples of why, you know, rule of law really underlines a lot of what we talk about in ESG. So I wonder if we might have any questions. If there are any, please do come up to the microphone. Hi, uh, I don't know if this is on. Can you hear me? Uh, my question um, is about how how the it, it seems like in most companies the general counsel has been typically tasked with with sort of overseeing ESG or before that CSR, um, and sometimes EDI will be in HR. <laughs> uh, so, um, but oftentimes I think that the person who's who's responsible for stewarding this through a company is is the general counsel's office, and I wonder how you get the CEO on board um, with that. How do you make the case to the board, the CEO, other you know, key stakeholders that this is really uh, in the company's best interest? Uh, because the general counsel sort of has this in their blood already uh, most of the time, but I, I think that piece of it is one. Um, stakeholder uh, activism has been one way to get that more of that, but I wonder uh, if you have any other tips on that, Klaus, or other, other folks about how companies um, what does that pathway look like? So I have thoughts on this answer, but before, I'd love to hear from the panel. Klaus, I see you've unmuted. Please, go right ahead. Oh, wow, you see, I unmuted. Yeah, yeah, Adley, I, I come back to my, my statement before. If you don't have the CEO and the board, and the board, involved as really actors and not passive listeners, it will not work. And I want to be really provocative and bold on this, because if not, we, we don't understand each other. 
As much as I love the general counsel as a colleague and peer and an executive committee, we, we all have a, a role there to play. And, but this is much more than a, a framework, which of course also needs legal advice and there are governance topics in there. The CEO, you get him, him or her, hopefully involved in the board if ESG is visibly a part of the company strategy. So go to the strategy of the company and see if topics like building, or in our case, rebuilding, trust to society, is part of the strategy, because there it starts. If it's not in the strategy there, the CEO has an easy way out. But she and he has to be intrinsically, intrinsically really motivated to drive this in the company. And, and I, from a very practical point as well, as I said, was it before, it will not work because you need resources from all over the company. I mean, ESG is not a fun game. This is based on serious data from a lot of different parts of the company. And if you don't have the full commitment of the top management and the board to get this data to together, which is also costly, to get the, the associates, the employees also really intrinsically motivated to support this, to drive this also, uh, it, 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 there's the, then it becomes a risk of a, of a paper exercise. So you have to link it to the strategy and the CEO, also it's difficult to say to convince her or him because then it already becomes a defensive player. It should be the, the intrinsic wish of the CEO to lead this also as a face uh, for, for the company. And again, talking about governance, the appropriate strategic oversight by the board in the best sense, in a dedicated committee where you also have board members who understand ESG, because this is also about professionalism and expertise. You need people who understand this. There's not only a buzzword, it's really, it's really a methodology behind this. So this would be my, my advice to, uh, to foster this in, in companies. Andrea, please. Um, I second everything that Klaus just said. Um, I was a general counsel in a couple of companies, plus a few other things over 18 years. And I can tell you without a doubt that what uh, Klaus just said about it has to be intrinsic to the CEO. Otherwise, it's, it's a constant battle. Uh, a general counsel has access to the CEO because they're usually on the executive team. Not always, but usually. Um, but it really takes the right kind of person. If the CEO isn't really naturally inclined to do this, um, if you have someone in the C-suite who is, who can influence that CEO, I think that's extraordinarily important, whether you're GC or not. And I think the other piece is exactly what Klaus said, the governance piece. You need to have the right kind of board members. You need to have board members who have ESG, corporate responsibility, risk management experience, who are asking these questions of the CEO. So I think it takes a different, it takes a village, so to speak, of people who get this and who then either influence the CEO because the CEO is not naturally disposed, or the CEO actually surrounds him or herself with the right people to create that ESG cross-functional team uh, that's necessary for the company. John, please. Michelle, um, if you have to persuade your CEO as a GC that this is an important subject for the board to focus on, you need a new CEO. If you've got to persuade your board of directors or the board doesn't pick up on this, you need some new directors. I think that uh, my perspective on this would be very similar, right? If you can walk into a room and have these conversations, it, if it's an uphill battle, it's it's, to your point, it's, it's a bit of an issue, right? Um, I often talk with members of sort of businesses, small and medium enterprises who are also grappling with these issues and it's a very similar conversation. I often point out how not adhering and not ensuring that you, especially on the DE&I um, issue, if you don't have the right policies in place, ultimately it is detrimental to your business. You're not bringing in folks with diverse perspectives. You're not bringing in people who might think differently. And these are the lifeline of any business to be able to continue to be uh, what I would say nimble to be able to adapt 
back to the society and changes that are that are happening around us uh, from what we've seen sort of happening in the United States over the past two years, what we see happening now in Ukraine, you need to be, and I think this is one of the reasons I enjoy Andrea, but sort of some of her work focuses on businesses need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to thrive and survive in this business and you need to understand what's uh, happening around you. You can't live in a silo because you're part of this of this ecosystem, you are part of the community. Um, and I think that's what sort of where ESG can really come to bear on a lot of what we're talking about. Um, are there any other questions that anyone might have for us? We've got, I think another 15 minutes left, please. Thank you, I was struck by the investor funds as a driver of ESG. And so my question is, what about the companies that are less susceptible to being swayed by investor sentiment? Public um, companies that are not publicly traded, uh, state-owned enterprises, the smaller enterprises that was just mentioned by Michelle. I was wondering if the panelists could comment on what about those companies that are sort of, we, I know that uh, Sipe likes to use the language of governance gaps. That could be a large governance gap where there isn't that interest in ESG and all of the aspects that flow from it that have been so uh, eloquently described this afternoon. Thank you. Well, one answer is that the, the investors will put pressure on, right? If they don't see the board and management responding, clearly investors will put pressure on. But pressure comes from other places depending on the nature of your business. You've got NGOs out there that are very interested in this subject. You've got individuals who in many cases purchase company products that are very interested. I mean, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of energy out there right now that can come from outside sources. And then you've got people who are there that are f fiduciaries and you have to assume, in most cases, that they want to do what's best for the company. And so, uh, you know, doesn't take a lot to read the tea leaves these days. Maybe, maybe going from a, a practical perspective, because that's actually where I'm at. I'm in a privately held company. It's not publicly traded. Um, Mid-sized, so same, same dilemma. The way we've gone about it is, um, is actually a bit of a different path than what's been described so far. I try very much bottom up to create that energy that, um, that people need to understand that it becomes an intrinsic value within the company, even without necessarily the board saying so. So what uh, a couple of practical things, maybe combining both questions, we um, use our talent program, our management trainee program, and their first task is a series of sustainability challenges. So the first group that's working on, um, well, the one, the group that's working on it right now is working on uh, a few different themes that I put together for them um, that guide them in different directions than their normal day-to-day -day work. So one is working on um, CO2 as an asset, so flipping that paradigm. Another is working on biodiversity. A third is working on how do you finance peace, thinking in the context of the war in Ukraine, and actually plan for that moment when the war is over. Um, I think these are sort of interesting things to think about um, in advance. But we also use our, our new employee introductions the same way. So sustainability is introduced from the moment people arrive in the company. And that automatically over time builds up a group of stakeholders within the company that are willing to talk about it, willing to engage, willing to be the activist within the company. And you said, you know, when you said employees, I, I missed that group, but there's no question that in a number of companies, a lot of the energy towards this comes from the employees. And if you're interested in, you know, recruiting and retention, uh, th this is another good set of issues that a the company absolutely. should be on top of. <laughs> and I absolutely. see that uh, Klaus has his hand up and so does Andrea. So if we could hear from Klaus and then Andrea, please. Yeah, this was just the point the colleagues made on the panel. I mean, don't underestimate the power of the young generation. What we see, the, the, the young generation wants to work in, an, uh, in companies which care, uh, care and kindness um, towards environment, towards social issues. Um, look at your own kids. I mean, 
they challenge me every day about what I'm doing in the company and what can we do better and, and why do we do this this way and, and rightfully and rightfully so we need to be challenged. So in, in a good, in a, in a positive framed war of talents for, for companies, the standalone enterprises, the, the non-listed enterprises have to face hopefully and for sure that the same questions by, by the young talents. Thank you. Andrea? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I think there's, there's for the, the organizations that are not as much in the public eye, like publicly traded companies, for example, um, there's a, there's a self-interest here that goes to resilience building and sustainable resilience building, meaning that you will be there next year and the year after. Um, and there are studies that show that companies that are innovating and doing these kinds of things uh, even during a crisis have a longer term uh, sustainability and resilience. So I think enlightened self-interest by those companies is really important and by their management. Um, <clears throat> I work with a, with a large privately held company in the United States that's very diversified and they started their ESG journey two, two and a half years ago. And the reason they did that is because they saw it as a competitive advantage in their various spaces um, <clears throat> doing some of the things that we just discussed, which is uh, retaining and attracting the right kind of talent, uh, the right kind of debt financing, the right kind of partners, the suppliers that you want to have. If you have government contracts, you want to have those kinds of things in place as well. So there's a lot of enlightened self-interest, even when you're not publicly traded, as well as competitive advantage and long-term resilience. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Angus Kelly. I'm from Irish Rule of Law International. Just a quick question um, to play devil's advocate to an extent, which is very important in the legal profession, as we all know, um, and to, to introduce a note of glumness. Um, would we not think that we're taking this question from a very Western orientated perspective? Um, and I'm, and you know, that's okay. And mo a lot of the wealth of the, of the planners at the moment is concentrated in the Western world. But uh, the reality is, you know, as was quoted by uh, the lady from uh, India who lives in South Africa in the earlier plenary, that only 3% of the world's population lives in places where they can freely express their opinions. And a lot of the capital that's uh, slushing around the world today is coming from places where people can't act freely. And therefore, without, to follow up on the gentleman, the rights uh, point, to fo without real hard black letter law, we're very dependent on this small group of countries and these small group of places. And that plays into a great game um, that big companies in the West will say, you can't break us up, you can't regulate us, because by doing that, we're weakened against those who don't comply with those laws, and it becomes a little bit of a race to the bottom. So I'm just curious to hear what the panel has to say about that. I know there's a lot of stuff there. We've only a few minutes left, but I'm just curious to hear your general views. Thank you. No, I think that is a wonderful question. Do we have any thoughts or responses to that? It, it's funny because I was just having a conversation before coming over here on this exact topic mm -hmm. with a colleague. And, and we were saying a bit um, uh, the same thing. How do you get out of that, that sort of death spiral, if you will, in terms of that race to the bottom? And I, I do think that's where building up, um, uh, advocating, um, and, and creating this ecosystem becomes more and more and more important. When I've been talking to my financial peers, it comes back to these points of, okay, what if the business goes to those that aren't asking the question? Um, how do you feel about that? And then I sort of think, well, the likelihood that that company then runs against us and we're not proud of what we're financing only increases. So, so how would you feel about that? So turn it around a little bit in terms of the way uh, the thought process works. It was a re it's a real challenge when, it, when these things make up any amount of the business that you're doing. So you actually have to go through it and replace those revenues from a commercial perspective. That's not easy. And I think that's the part that gets overlooked. That's why some of these transitions take time. Um, including the, the transition that we've gone through ourselves. So. You know, Andrea mentioned companies on their sustainability journeys, and uh, that's also another good source of pressure because if you're on your sustainability journey, one of the things that you need to do is 
address the sustainability values with your in mo mostly first tier once in a while including second tier suppliers so there's the responsibility to to push this to your suppliers as well and a lot of us are suppliers and uh, and we know that some of our clients take these issues quite seriously and the same is true in the commercial world as well plus if you have competitors that are far ahead of you and you're lagging um, you'll catch up or you may find yourself uh, dropping some business that you'd like not to drop um, Andrea Klaus please uh, yeah I, I was going to make the point about the suppliers I think uh, you know a, a reverse way to look at it and it's maybe more of the opt optimist view and I share uh, the pessimism and and some of the uh, challenges <clears throat> with the person who questioned us um, but I think that the reverse side of that is as we uh, continue to do business internationally and large multinationals, uh, whether they're from the region or from other parts of the world, uh, are subjected to the regulators, the supply chain issues, et cetera. Um, they're kind of lifting all boats rather than uh, depressing. So I've seen a lot of developments, for example, in Latin America. There's a big uh, ESG ecosystem in Brazil, for example, where there's multinationals, there's little uh, suppliers, producers, they're all coming together on a platform to, to sort of raise sustainability issues and climate issues. Um, uh, in Asia, you see it too, and I think uh, the new generations in those parts of the world are also working towards this. I've also seen some of this in Africa. So I think that um, it's a battle, it's a challenge, a set of challenges, but I think one can see boats rising as well. Thank you for that. Klaus? And again, it's it's a very fair fair question, and the question we we face in many areas of ethics, risk, and compliance. I mean, it's a classical point: what do we do with companies who are not following anti-bribery or uh, culture and, and and laws? And as we all know, there is the answer can't be okay. Then we level the playing field, but the wrong way. We have to first of all. I'm a big believer. We need we need more success stories, or uh, where we tangibly show where's the benefit. And and for this, we need to get ESG, but under really reliable and good standards into the systems. And system, for example, uh, of, of insurance policies. If you just don't get your project insured anymore because you don't follow, you, have, you don't have the right ESG uh, culture and standards in your big infrastructure project, for example, that's then you're simply you're simply out of business. You don't get the the insurance um, by um, for for the project. So. Co collective action. So when companies really uh, join forces and also more with the, the private public uh, collaboration, there's still a lot of mistrust and suspicion. The more we can there do together to create these success stories, there's still a big suspicion even in the Western world between the private and the public sector. We have to overcome this and say this is a joint belief and a joint success stories. And if you get this done, uh, we, I think we can be much more convincing than uh, running there in silos as in the past. And I'll add to that, that most of my work around the sort of ESG and sort of these standards and sort of moving the business community actually happens in emerging markets and it happens in nascent um, democracies. And I think what I see as part of my work is that this is the space where civil society comes in. This is a space where sort of NGOs and also small and medium-sized businesses can really do have an impact. And you can see that they actually drive some of this and they do so at great risk to themselves. They're not free to talk about some of these issues. It can be, um, you know, life-threatening at, at times. But um, I think this is the point that I was hoping to have made with this with this uh, panel that there is a space for this conversation, for this dialogue, and that it's really important um, at this point in, in history for, for I think everyone, not just sort of for those of us who live in uh, Western democracies. I think we are at time, if I am correct, so with one minute to spare. Um, so I just want to thank uh, our panelists here. Um, they um, d volunteered their time. <laughs> they uh, allowed me to sort of uh, bring them all together numerous times to sort of talk about this panel. 
So thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. I think this was an important conversation. I want to thank the World Justice Forum for having us here, and I want to thank everyone who's here in the audience who asked great questions and who listened to our panel. I hope that uh, you walk away with some food for thought in terms of this conversation and sort of how the private sector and business can really have an impact on rule of law. Thank you everyone so much.